Hey you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this old video, well, yo, know, it's Halloween, or, uh, you know, all of October is Halloween for me. So this old story takes us to a haunting night in Canada, when a young woman was out walking to go trick or treating. It was a night full of ghouls, ghosts, and goblins, but as she was walking along a railroad track in a very dark and secluded area, she would encounter something far more terrifying than she was expecting. Let's give it a go. It was October 31st, which is scientifically the spookiest night of the year, in the quiet Canadian city of Armstrong, British Columbia. Armstrong is a rural and sleepy town, almost a five hour drive northeast of Vancouver, sitting in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. It sits in this little valley surrounded by the endless hills and forests of the province. It's farming, it's logging, and it's home to a little less than about 5,000 people. One of them in 2011 was 18-year-old Taylor Van Deest, and she was just brimming with excitement because it was Halloween. That was her favorite time of the year. This was a big one for her. She had just graduated local high school a few months back, Something she had really succeeded at. She was learning to drive, and it was in that like transitional moment of her life. You know, she's just about to become an adult and go out there to explore the world. Part of her, you know, part, part of you, you know, wants to stay at home with your family where it's safe. And another part of you wants to get out there and see where the road takes you to explore the world and yourself. So this particular autumn, and Taylor wasn't quite sure where the road would take her. She didn't know what she wanted to do. She was thinking this, she was thinking that. But this is the last fall season where you can do things you'd do as a kid. So, trick-or-treating was the plan, something she hadn't done for years, and it would be a bit of fun. Taylor was someone who put maximum effort into things, just like her Halloween costume that evening, which was something she was debating as she posted on Facebook that day. Zombie, or Mother Nature slash Wood Nymph type look. Taylor settled on zombie. Taylor and her friends Zoe and Clay, they were planning on going house to house for some sweets and then getting up to some creepy mischief. And after trick-or-treating, she would then meet up with her boyfriend, Colton. It was 5.45pm on October 31st that Taylor left the home she shared with her mother, Marie, and her twin sister, Kirsty. She was en route to meet up with her friends and boyfriend, and was taking a route she knew very well. She was texting Clay as she walked. Hero, Clay, hurry, Zoe Zoe's on her way, we'll meet you at your place. Now Zoe was supposed to meet Taylor at her place and then together the two of them would walk to Clay's, but Taylor left her home before Zoe arrived. I'm guessing she was just really eager to get out there and begin the night. She was so excited. So she began walking alone and probably would just meet Zoe at Clay's house. She left her home on Colony Avenue and walked up the few minutes along Pleasant Valley Road to Rosedale Avenue. And then she began following the train tracks that cut through town, still texting her friends along the way. This was at about 6 p.m. It was cold, it was dark, and the loons were out and about. It was not long after that Taylor texted Colton, something very short, but very scary being creeped, spelt like that, which made it just all the more ominous. As if she was so desperate to get the text out, she didn't have time to correct herself. Colton replied to her and got no response, which was even more worrying because Taylor Van Deest was a texter. That's when he began worrying and she'd been texting her friends all night, but it suddenly stopped all of a sudden. And so they began replying, hey, where are you? You know, we're here, we're ready to go out. Nothing. The replies were eerily quiet. It was about two hours later that another group of teens just so happened to be walking along those same railroad tracks. And as they were walking, what did I see there on the ground? A phone buzzing, exploding like crazy, vibrating on those tracks, making so much noise. So they picked it up, seeing that it was exploding with calls, missed calls, texts, all that asking. These texts were worrying. Where are you? Where are you? Are you okay? This group then picked up the phone and they responded to the people who were texting saying, hey, we found this phone. They responded to Taylor's friends and to her mother who had been alerted at this stage too. They all raced to those railroad tracks and began looking around to see if they could, they could find out what was going on. And the police were alerted too. 
Now those railroad tracks were very dark, and an already dark night. And on either side is where you take bushes and trees, but they were all there, walking along with their phones out, flashlights out, calling out for her, hoping she would answer. At approximately 8.45, they saw something in the bushes, just about 10 feet off the railroad in the deep, deep bushes. Going over, they saw it was a young woman's body covered in blood. And, a, and most of that blood was not zombie makeup. Taylor was semi-conscious, mumbling, covered in blood. She was alive, but barely. They placed jackets over her as they waited for the EMTs to arrive with her mother, who was a care worker, saying to Taylor, who seemed to be slipping really, really quickly, saying, Fight it. You're going to make it. You're going to survive. Taylor was rushed to a nearby hospital, and it was found she had severe head trauma, skull fractures, and ligature marks around her neck. She also had defensive wounds on her. Her nails had blood under them. She'd fought off whoever, whoever did this. But she soon, you know, lost consciousness. She had to be intubated. But the damage done to her, her skull, her brain was just too much. And very early the next morning, Taylor Van Dies passed away. Reeling tonight after a young woman was discovered near the railway track. She's died of her injuries. And now a major investigation has been launched into this bizarre Halloween murder. Police now have a mystery on their hands. Now, last night, Taylor was supposed to meet up with someone, and when she failed to show, police were called. They were joined by friends and family in the search and along the railway line that is sometimes used as a shortcut here. And that's where they found Taylor, severely injured. Her twin sister wrote on Facebook that she was suffering from severe head trauma and in critical condition, and she later died in the Kelowna Hospital. Police are short on details. They confirm it is a homicide, but little else, and no details on possible suspects. Instead, they're looking for help. People are understandably frightened and are looking for answers. Some people in the area that night reported hearing a woman screaming. But it's Halloween. They taught nothing of it, right? It's a time full of screams, even blood-curdling ones. One woman was tending to her pumpkins just outside her front door putting candles in them, you know, for the trick-or-treaters. She heard screams coming directly from the railroad, which is even more haunting. And that last text she sent, being creeped, made shivers run down everyone's spine. Who had been out there that Halloween night? Someone who didn't need to dress as a monster to be a walking nightmare. But had she known who it was? Had she gone there? She left her house early before waiting for Zoe because she went to meet someone there along those tracks. Or was she followed? From the text she sent, that was most likely. Probably hearing footsteps behind her as she walked the dark tracks. There is any possibility someone could have followed her, could have met up with her, or could have by chance met her there. Police released these photos of the Halloween costume Van Dies was wearing that night. She went as a zombie and was wearing a tan jacket over her costume. We were canvassing all along that route to see whether or not people will jog their memory saying, oh yeah, I saw her that evening or I saw her with person or persons. Soon the police were asking locals not to walk around alone. And of course, following up with everyone she'd been in contact with before she was attacked. The police spread the word, how she was dressed that night in case anyone saw her and maybe saw anyone suspicious near her. Bizarrely, within a week of the murder, the RCMP received a letter claiming to be from the killer. The contents of that letter have never been revealed. The author has never been revealed. But they wrote, whoever wrote this sick piece of shit, they wrote saying that they were planning more acts of violence against women in the area. Great. Someone claiming to be the killer sent police a letter threatening to strike again. Now investigators have to figure out if it's real or a hoax. We see it as a form of communication from this individual, these individuals. We certainly want to carry on with this dialogue with them. Now, as I said, who sent this in, what they disclosed, and, and from the letter claiming to be the killer, it seemed like by what they wrote, it's like they got details wrong, so they didn't do it. So it was soon determined, it, it was soon determined to be a hoax. But I mean, seriously, very, very uncool. Like the opposite of that, like hot. You might even call it hot, but like, not in, a, not in a good way. Sick bastards. It was at the end of November, almost a month after Taylor's attack. The RCMP made a breakthrough. The blood and skin found under Taylor's nails led them to a suspect. 
However, suspect was as far as it went at the time. See, the DNA matched that of another attack. A woman, a, a masseuse in the area had been, uh, you know, masseusing. Happy ending style masseuse. When the, in 2005, she was sexually assaulted. In Kelowna in 2005, when he assaulted a woman who worked at this escort agency on Lawrence Avenue. That still to this day remained unsolved, but now six years later, here he's doing it again. Now, it's important to tell uh, Van Dies she wasn't sexually assaulted, but kind of seemed like he didn't, I don't know, have time or something. She managed to fight him off anyway. But there was likely a sexual predator in the area. And as we see in these cases, it's only a matter of time for it to strike again. Finding him would prove extremely difficult. Like trying to locate a, a needle in a haystack. Or, or even a person using some kind of virtual private network. A VPN, you might say. Just like me. See, I'm not at home right now, as you probably, uh, you know, guessed. I'm traveling, right, to film some videos. Might be no ghost. Motive was Chuck Stewart. There's money, obviously. Do you know where the great elf? No. Oh, yeah. She wasn't having that at all. Let's see if she's around. Things did not go well for that. So physically, I'm here. But virtually, I'm back in Ireland, baby. Especially thanks to NordVPN, who happened to be sponsoring this old video. In this day and age of constant security breaches, Nord is the app that will keep you and your online activities safe. Nord has the very best VPN. Believe me, I've tried a few and nothing compares to Nord's. I use it almost every day. With a single click, I can be in any country I want to be. Trying to trace me? Good luck in all the languages, because trying to find my IP address is like a wild goose chase. Cybersecurity these days is so important, and that is where Nord shines, with its features like Nord's MeshNet, where you can safely connect to any other device in the world. No wires, no nothing. And Nord has a very special deal that is just for you. I begged, I, was, I begged, and they said, no. Not for you, only for my viewers. Using my special link, that is nordvpn.com slash that chapter. Every purchase of a two year plan will receive four months extra for free. Get that using this link or the one in the description. Free? In this economy? Yeah, turns out. And of course, NordVPN has data scanners. Or how about Nord's threat protection, keeping you safe from any hackers, malicious websites, trackers, phishing ransomware, all that nasty stuff is no more. So once again, please use my special link. That is nordvpn.com slash that chapter to get an amazing deal. Every two year purchase gets you four months for free on top. And Nord of course has a 30 day money back guarantee. So you know you can trust them. Thank you so much to NordVPN for sponsoring that chapter. Now let's, you and I, let's get back in. Now, there was a witness from that earlier attack, and a sketch was done revealing the suspect to be a white guy, 5'10", stocky, about 20 years of age, which would make him mid to late 20s now. It's also believed he was a local, this is a quite, you know, sleepy little town, not a whole lot of people traveling through, and especially that railroad, where Taylor had been attacked. I mean, only locals would know about that and that sort of thing. Police sent this out, asking people to be on the lookout and see if this matched anyone they knew, and remember, you know, if it does, check, you know, did he have any visible wounds, scratches on him, blood pumping out, all, something like that, around Halloween. Tips soon started rolling in, soon over a thousand, all of which had to be followed up. And again, it's like, was this guy wearing a costume? It was Halloween. Was he wearing a costume? Was he dressed like a monster? It doesn't need to dress like it, but, beauty. Tips came in, but a lot of them were centered around this one lad, this one buccal. Fishy-like was the word. A guy who lived in Cherryville, a town approximately one hour away further into the mountain valleys. A guy named Matthew Forrester. He matched the description and was known to be emotional and volatile. And he was, get, get a lot of this, nowhere to be found. The police rocked up, went to speak with him. They found his apartment empty. They went to speak with his landlord. The landlord had a funny story, he said, just after Hall, get this, just after Halloween, Matthew came to me saying he needed to go. He's at 85,000 and he was asking for his, uh, his security deposit back. The landlord said, you know, it'll take a couple of days. So Matthew said, I'm out of here. He left without taking his security deposit. He also left all of his shit in the apartment. So he was ready to go. There was a Matthew Forrester shaped hole in the wall. 
So he had been in a hurry, it seems, didn't want to stick around in the area long. Then, Matthew Forrester's dad was the one who came, packed up all his stuff, all his stuff for him. When Matthew Forrester's L fellow was questioned, he said, Don't worry about all Matty over here. He went to work in oil fields, oil fields up north. Uh, you know, up there somewhere, around, around those parts. As believable as this was, that was. But that's what Matthew Forrester's dad, Stephen Forrester, was saying, you know, that's why he left so quickly. The money was too good, they needed him on short notice. He had to go. He had to get that black old. No, that sounds like <clears throat> bullshit. But I think the police might not have believed anything Stephen Forrester told them. Since 1969, Stevie had a criminal record. In and out, in and out, again and again. Auto theft, escaping custody, drugs offences, having a restricted weapon, all that. And so, of course, trying to follow up with this oil, oil bullshit, they would be chasing their tail. They were immediately false. Following up on Matthew Forrester's phone records, it showed he had been in Armstrong on Halloween night and gathering some of his DNA, not sure how, but presumably from an item he left behind, it was determined to be a match with Taylor's killer. They only had one small problem now, though. Finding him. Canada's like... Big. Obviously, Stephen Forrester was lying, but he would not crack. Not for his son. Then a friend's nephew, a friend of Stephen, approached the police, and he told the police that his nephew, he needed a bit of cash. So he sold his identity to Stephen Forrester for $500. $500 for a driving license, an old bank card, and his social insurance number. He'd, get, he'd sold them to Stephen Forrester, who had passed them on. Matthew Forrester was now Lee Shawcross. But again, where the hell now is Lee Shawcross? Stephen was key to solving all this. All the effort he had gone through for his son, and he was clearly lying about it. So the police tapped his phone and listened to all of his calls. And it didn't take too long to reveal a lot of those calls were made to Matthew Forrester. But not once did he reveal where he was. That is, until a slip of the tongue in March 2012. Matthew had fled to Ontario and was working at a glass factory in Collingwood, northwest of Toronto. And it was during the very same conversation when Matthew just kind of slipped a tongue. Oh yeah, the old job in Collingwood, it's great. Um, it was during that very same conversation Stephen told his son, Stop calling me. For fuck's sake, like, they're probably to listen to all of this. They're probably listening to all this shite on talking about this, so just stop calling me. Before you say something and they hear it. They had heard it. It didn't take long to track down this Lee Shaw Cross and arrest both him and his dad, murder and aiding a fugitive, respectively. Matthew was extradited back to British Columbia. When he was being interrogated, he did not crack. He didn't say anything about Taylor Vendis. He didn't say he had met her, killed her, anything. This went on for hours and hours and hours until the police asked him one simple question. Did he feel bad for killing Taylor? Sorry. 
Matthew would say that on the night of, he'd been drinking and smoking the devil's lettuce. He had been in Armstrong specifically looking for sex. And he saw Taylor as she walked that dark path beside the railroad. And you can imagine what was going through his mind when he saw her or going down a dark path, although it's probably better you don't. He followed her walking faster and faster with Taylor giving him terrified looks over her shoulder, fumbling at her phone to text her boyfriend. Then Matthew approached. He said they began talking for a couple of minutes when all of a sudden he pushed her to the ground and told her to be quiet. She didn't comply. She began shouting and roaring. So he jumped on her. He started strangling her. She fought back swiping hard at the cord around her neck and at his neck, scratching him, and then began screaming. A scream neighbors would hear, but have no reaction to. Then he slammed her head down six times and was hitting her with a mag light flashlight he had, splitting her skull. He had been there to sexually assault her, but she put up such a fight, he ran away. It was Taylor who solved her own murder, trying to fight him off. It has been two and a half long years for the family and friends of an Armstrong teenager found beaten to death, and now they are finally getting their day in court. The community of Armstrong was shocked when 18-year-old Taylor Van Deest was found unconscious. 28-year-old Matthew Forrester was later charged with first-degree murder. His trial begins today in Kelowna. He went on trial in March 2014 and was found guilty of Taylor's murder, first degree. He was sentenced to life with no parole for 25 years. One month later, Stephen Forrester was also sentenced for protecting his son and aiding a fugitive, someone he knew was a killer and could kill again. He got three years. Now you'd think that'd be it, but the shit just kept rolling in for Matthew Forrester over here. He was later charged with his attack on the masseuse, and then another attack, six months before that even. In the middle of the night, he broke into where a 19-year-old woman was sleeping and he attacked her. He was wearing a face mask, had a BB gun and threw her against the wall saying he wanted her before he shat his pants and he ran. He pled guilty to both of those attacks and got six years each concurrently with his life sentence, which in turn would be later changed. This fucking guy. In 2016, an appeal by his lawyers was successful. The judge made some mistakes in his instructions to the jury, and so a new trial date was set. But before that could happen, Matthew got a plea deal and pleaded guilty. So instead of no parole for 25 years, now it was life with no parole for 17 years, at least. So this monster could be it sooner, if he gets parole, which he probably won't. But you never know. And it just goes to show that like all of all, you know, the ghouls and spooky shit, and all of that stuff that's out there in Halloween, it's monsters like Matthew Forrester who are far more insidious and terrifying than anything we can invent. And a lot less fun too, because they're, you know, kind of shit. And I love Halloween, but not him. He sucks. He has no part in Halloween, but he is a monster, that's for sure. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, I really appreciate you being here, watching this whole video with me. It means, it means so much to me, so thank you. Um, Hey, listen, um, yeah, thanks for watching. And if you're looking for more of that chapter content, please check out the Patreon for two bucks a month. You get early access to videos and there's a, he a whole heap of exclusive videos there. And you can also check out the That Chapter podcast, which I think a lot of you guys seem to like. Uh, <laughs> Key gets a little low. Um, that's out every Monday on all pod podcast platforms. So check it out where we're talking about Halloween and we're talking about uh, scary stories and we're talking about uh, urban legends and we're talking about real life murders and real life serial killers a little bit of everything in there it's kind of a whole like stew of fun times but also dark times but you know give it a go but until the next whole video uh please take care of each other please take care of yourselves especially this halloween the most wonderful time of year take care of yourselves because i love you my game.